Hey, it is me and I am back again. Now, believe it or not, I recorded a video a couple of days ago and uh, there were 15 minutes of it. And I thought, first of all, that's too long. And second of all, when I reviewed it, I said that Queen Victoria had uh, would not grant a patent for knitting machines because she was afraid that it would put knitters out of uh, business and take uh, work from them away from them. And then when I was watching the video, I thought, hey, wait a minute. It was Queen Elizabeth who at first would not grant a patent on the knitting machine. So I thought, ah, I could post that and post a disclaimer, but now nah, I'm just going to make a new video. And also, I decided that since next week we are going to be talking about the status of women, I would hold off and talk about children uh, during this week because we are reading Oliver Twist. And, uh, of course, that uh, uh, novel centers on Oliver, who has a twist in fortune, and some of the aspects of his early life and uh, later life. Not too much later, but after he gets adopted. Um, I had a professor, Dr. Joel Chaston at MSU, where I got my master's degree, who said that the Victorians created childhood. And he said this because uh, for the first time, we had a widespread belief among the upper class, not the lower class, mind you, that childhood was a special time. It was a time of innocence and children were to be cosseted and protected. And the children of upper class and noble families were protected. Uh, children, though, in the lower classes had very little or no protection. So while uh, people who had money would, would literally shower their children with, um, with gifts, and if you've ever seen some of the toys from the Victorian era, you would know that they were quite complicated, and in part, um, that was due to the Industrial Revolution and the ability to make mechanized toys. Uh, they were also rather um, made rather secular in that they could not, uh, that's not the word that I wanted, not secular, sequestered, in that they didn't have a lot of um, influence or mingling with the outer world, and that was one way to protect them. I also want to uh, touch on fairy tales, and you think, what does this have to do with the Victorian era? It started before the Victorian era, but fairy tales uh, at their inception, which is long lost to time, were very brutal. They were sexually graphic, they were violent, and they were intended for adults as much as they were intended for children. And children in those earlier times were more perceived as small adults than children. But in the Victorian era, we begin to see a shift away from the violence in those uh, fairy tales to what we have today in Disney. The uh, now Grimm, the, the uh, Grimm brothers, had uh, sanitized the, fair, the German fairy tales, and it continued even more to the point where uh, Little Red Riding Hood is no longer eaten by the wolf and stays eaten, but she is rescued by, uh, she and her grandmother are rescued by the woodsman. Um, other fairy tales uh, were, again, just as uh, brutal as that, and now we have in the Disney tales where there's no brutality, and the violence is uh, very much minim minimalized. Uh, and the sexual aspects are gone. For example, uh, Sleeping Beauty in the original, she woke up because she was uh, pregnant with twins because she had been raped by a nobleman who had been riding by her um, where she was enclosed in her bower. So we also see that reflected in the literature of the time that continued on well into modern times. But back to this ideology, the, uh, the idyllic aspects of childhood. So we have this in the upper upper class, but in the lower class, children were mistreated horribly. Children worked in factories, uh, and they uh, were chimney sweeps, and they worked in mines. And the reason why children were particularly uh, apt in being chimney sweeps and working in mines was simply because of their size. As a matter of fact, uh, short people had uh, been uh, employed in mines and is the basis for 
the myths of the dwarves. Didn't know that, did you? And so they were uh, able to fit in spaces where adults could not fit. And this also is true of factories. Children were often used in factories to get into spots that uh, adults could not uh, squeeze into. So children would work from dusk to dawn, literally, and they were very mistreated in these factories. And they were beaten, just like Oliver was, in order to maintain the quality of their work. Children also worked in brothels, and this is just a horrendous idea to us, and our ideas of um, and pedophilia, and um, we can't even fathom that. But it wasn't even always enforced prostitution because children were gonna do what they could do in order to make enough money to survive. And the marriage uh, age of uh, in in Victorian England, I know that it was 12 years old when the when the um, when the era began, and it might have been changed to 14 later on. And yeah, we have some issues with that still in modern times, in that some religious denominations or lunatic fringe religions have child brides. Now, there were arranged marriages, and uh, um, perhaps not so much in the Victorian era, but certainly in other era, eras, where um, children would be betrothed and even married, but they wouldn't live together. And that idea of the child bride is certainly nothing new in the Victorian era and had been going on for a long, long time. So that wasn't anything new, but it continued on. So this idealization of uh, children on one hand by the rich and the noble and the horrible treatment of children at the other end again shows this huge disparity in Victorian uh, thinking and the Victorian social class. It wasn't ideologies that were applied to everybody, but to the special few. And add into that the rise of the middle class and those children tended to be um, rather protected as well. Perhaps not as much as the very rich and the noble because their parents might not have been able to afford it quite as much, but yet they were protected. Um, Oliver, uh, Pip, and uh, the children in hard times, they were not the rich and the noble, and they were subjected again to these, um, just the... I can't even emphasize it enough. It's something that we can almost not comprehend, even though it is still going on in places in the world, third world countries, where children do work uh, in factories and, uh, and so on and so on in order to produce goods for us here in America. Um, so keep this in mind as you are reading these novels and the realistic aspects. Is Oliver Twist, though, really realistic? This is one of the, uh, the prompts in the discussion. Is it exaggerated or not? I do not think that the um, exploitation of children is exaggerated at all in this novel. But yes, this novel has some big exaggerations or is unrealistic in other aspects. And what I'm talking about is, of course, Oliver's adoption and how he is, uh, real, and I, the, the name of the man totally and utterly escapes me. Um, I, mean, I was just reviewing the novel again last night, but the man who, um, who adopts uh, Oliver turns out that Oliver is related to him. What are the odds of that happening? I'm not saying that it can't happen, but what are the odds? And when he first sees Oliver, he keeps being reminded of something. And then finally he realizes that it is um, his, his sister. Um, that is not realistic. And it, I wonder then if it does not set, if it did not set unrealistic expectations of the people who read these novels. Here are all these children being uh, mistreated but for Oliver, at least, there is some reprieve to that. Pip, as well, is mistreated as a child, but goes on um, to, um, to be somewhat successful after his great expectations grind to a halt. The children in hard times, not so much, not so much. So what did the Victorians think when they read this? Did they say, oh, there's light at the end of the tunnel? Or as in Christmas Carol, 
is their hope for redemption. Scrooge redeems himself. He's going to save Tiny Tim. But how often did that happen in actual Victorian times and uh, within the culture and the society? We would like to think that it happened, but really it didn't. Um, oh, and I know what else I was going to say. I almost forgot. I want to ask you, is Oliver Twist a fairy tale? I mentioned fairy tales in relation to how they changed over, uh, over decades and uh, segued from being really rather violent and explicit into very tame stories. Oliver Twist fits the aspects of not only the fairy tale, but the hero myth. Oliver is born uh, you know, poor, doesn't know who his parents are, but it has a happy ending, just like fairy tales do. And fairy tales are highly didactic. They teach a lesson. What lessons are we supposed to learn from Oliver Twist? Is it that hard work uh, pays off? How did Oliver do hard work? Yeah, he certainly had hard times. But did he really work towards achieving his final happy ending? And what about poor Nancy? I'm not going to go into Nancy because I want to talk about the status of women uh, next week. But what lesson is, the, which lessons are these teaching people in the Victorian era? And what does that tell us about what people wanted to happen in the Victorian era, whether it happened or not? And one more thing, and then I'm going to be quiet because I'm up to 11 uh, minutes and 41 seconds. Oliver does fit the monomyth of the hero. He doesn't know his parents growing up. He's mistreated. He goes on a quest. He has, um, I won't say he has supernatural aid, but he does have outside um, help and aid. And it all ends happily, and he learns a lesson. Uh, I'm... I don't know, I'm going to retract that learn a lesson, but it all turns out well. I'm going to stop there, but just keep in mind that uh, the status of children and in this book, there are realistic aspects and I see unrealistic aspects as well. So we can all hope for a happy ending, but unfortunately in real life, it just doesn't turn out that way.